Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. To keep the show going through 2024 and beyond, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. 100 Patreon subscribers guarantees that this show will be financially stable and we'll be able to bring you content for years to come. We are only 35 Patreon subscribers away from hitting this first goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, you'll receive a special monthly discount off all your orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, whether in person or online. You'll be entered to win weekly prize giveaways that only our Patreon members have access to. You'll have access to members-only content and live streams and access to our private Facebook group community. Also, you will be the reason that this show keeps going. This show was created for the people of the DMV area. Please, if you feel like you can help out, link down below in the episode description. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody, and this is really is a good evening. We are about three hours behind on when I do a freaking live stream, and right now we got 15 people on Facebook and YouTube. We got 28 people watching on Instagram. I love my Instagram crowd. Um, we're going to try to fast track this. This is going to be a short and sweet show, but I kind of wanted to bring everyone a light because this is the reason I got, I had the opportunity and I was able to get on the Maryland uh, Black Bass uh, board to really talk about what's going on with Maryland and bass fishing. And I'm a newbie. I've only been to two meetings. And so I wanted to bring on really a veteran, the guy that's really been helping keep the Potomac and all these fisheries the way they are for so long. Uh, Captain Steve Chaconis is in the house. Thank you so much for coming on. I know it's been a long day. Yeah. You know, we uh, received a lot of nominations. A lot of people applied for the uh, for the position to be on the Black Bass Advisory Committee. And when I saw your name, I said, oh, God, please. Not him. <laughs> We can't, we can't have him on this thing, but no, Thomas, you're, you're a great asset to it. And, and I tell you, it was a good meeting for, for you to be at because we renominated and, and elected again, our committee chairman, Roger Trageser, who I've been working with for since, uh, probably almost 20 years or longer, uh, to, to on this, on this committee and other committees where we are trying to do what we can to, to represent fishermen, bass fishermen, black bass fishermen uh, in the state of Maryland. That includes the Potomac River. And that's what we are. We're the representatives. And I hope your audience can, can I mean, hammer us with, with any kind of ideas that you have, emails. I'm sure you do that texting and blogging and, you know, all that the other creative stuff that you do out there. Tell us what's on your mind, what you'd like to see, because we take that and we bring it into the meetings. We go, hey, People are asking us about and one of the things that you brought up is an issue we've been playing with for a long time, and that's hall signing. And it came up mm -hmm. again in, in tonight's meeting. But congratulations to Roger. Uh, we're, we're glad to have him on board as, as the president or as the chairman, as the vice chairman, the smartest guy in the room, always Dick Barrick. Uh, he was he was elected. And um, and we got a good I, th I really do believe this is the best group of people that we've had on this committee since I've been part of it. It's it's a really great group of guys. And and then as always, guys, this episode, I know it's a little bit later than what my audience is because everyone works on Monday, but this will be re-uploaded as a special podcast episode tomorrow. So I know everyone's going to see this. Email me or get in contact with me if you have any questions about what we're discussing tonight. I'm going to release some of the notes that we're I think we're allowed to talk about with this thing and we can kind of just go in order. Uh, some of these things are probably going to be more more hot than others. Um, I think we should start with the Nanjamoin thing and just still pond and the water cellian thing, since that's we were just talking about that before we went live. Right. Um, the, his, the history of it, as you pointed out in our meeting, uh, Skeet Reese won a, a Bassmaster tournament in there, and it was like a hot place. And today we found out why it it is not a hot place anymore. Uh, a couple of things: one, they stopped launching tournaments out of there, and we talk about moving fish around quite a bit. When you have a tournament site that's in Nanjamoy, people leave Nanjamoy, they come back and release their tournament fish in Nanjamoy, that's a stocking program. They get stocked. Well, they close that. So then they quit stocking. But the other thing, we always talk about habitat and we talk about environment. And environment in this case is saltwater, saltwater intrusion. Uh, Dr. Joe Love told us that, hey, that's a that's a big impact uh, on that fishery. And and that's why you're not, so you're not getting it stocked 
and the fish that are there aren't hanging around very long, or they're in very small places where they have a, a good freshwater flow. And, uh, you know, we talked about it, and before we went on, we talked about if you understand that, then you understand what's wrong with some fisheries. It's either habitat or environment. And before everybody starts saying, oh, we just need to put more fish there, we got to make sure we have the habitat and we have the environment. Could you talk a little bit about, because this is out of really my area of expertise, the still pond area and I guess the upper bay. Is that a place that, so guys, one of the meeting topics, and I'll try to go in a little bit of order here, is stocking still pond area of the upper bay again. Yeah, I, you know, I, it's not one of the areas that I'm very familiar with, but apparently it's a, it's a small area. Uh, Steve Weimer is from Pennsylvania, runs a lot of tournaments, and uh, he said his his guys go in there and they don't really catch a lot of fish. But if you talk to Scott Sewell, who fished it a lot in the late 90s, and I had to ask him if that was the 1990s or 1890s because he's he's a little older than the rest of us. But and uh, he was able to go in there and catch a lot of fish at one point. And again, this is a situation where, when you when you go into a small fishery or a small area of a fishery and you catch fish, you're not you're not taking the small ones. You're taking the bigger ones, and the bigger fish take a long time. If you look at a fish population, you know the bottom of that triangle. That's your 12 inch fish or eight to 10 12 inch fish, and as you get to the bigger fish up near the top, you get fewer and fewer. So if you start taking those off the top then those places don't become very popular fisheries anymore. But, but uh, you know, in hearing what uh, some of the DNR people said about going in there, um, uh, we had one guy, uh, Brett, I can't remember his last name, but he's with the DNR. He says he fishes there a lot. And he says he's seen, while he's out looking for crabs, he's seen guys who are practicing for pro tournaments up in there catching a few bass and saying they're going to spend all their time in there. So it is, it's one of the estuaries off of the, uh, off the upper bay. And um, a lot of a lot of the guys still think it's it's a viable place. And the only thing you need to do to is put more fish in there. Mm-hmm. But they're talking about salinity. If you put them in there, they're either going to die or they're going to leave as soon as they can. And that that becomes the dilemma when we're all trying to make our fisheries better. We we forget about habitat and environment, and it all comes back down to that. So that was one of the, the major topics uh, of the night. The, the other big, the other big news. I kind of, I kind of brought this up. Um, so the for all you guys that I know, smallmouth fishing is a big part mm-hmm. of the DMV area, not just the Tidal Potomac. You have the Susquehanna River, the Upper Potomac, Shenandoah, all these great smallmouth fisheries. The uh, Maryland has is decided that they have they have won, so to speak. They've gotten the smallmouth population back up to the 2018 levels, and they're shutting down the smallmouth program. Um, I I don't know how I feel about this. I just my first thought was kind of like what Brandon just said in the comment section. Uh, Brandon just said, "Bullshit! Why would the department shut down the smallmouth program? They flathead will take over now." I really am curious about how many. I understand their thought process here. It's a smallmouth are expensive as hell to raise. Um, I, ju- I reached out to, to Mulligan and Mike to get them on the show to go through their PowerPoints for everyone to see. I really want you guys to see the data and stuff because smallmouth are hard as hell to raise. There's only three states right now that actually raise smallmouth, Maryland, Virginia, and, and South Carolina. That's it. They're hard. So I get the money tra- thing here, but I want to give them some credit. They did this. For as long as I think they they thought they could, and there are people choosing to go fish the Upper Potomac instead of the Susquehanna right now. I have multiple guides that say it's just really good, and it's because of the work they did. So before the comment section gets too heated, um, yeah, I, I it sucks, but they did do a hell of a job. Yeah, you know, you have Jeff Green on uh, a lot, and I fished with him, and he I he knows that water better than anyone else. He says it's fishing better than he's seen it in a long time. Um, you know, part of the problem they had on that upper Potomac and I don't fish it a lot, but I've, I've been aware of it and seen all the studies. You have too much water coming down, big floods It uh, it removes the SAVs and it, it causes turbidity. And those are two things that are not good for a spawn for, for any kind of fish, but particularly for smallmouth bass. But when you set a goal and it's a stocking goal that they set, they go, what number do we want to hit? And they go through and they go, 2018, and that was the last good year we had. If we could get to that, our work here is done. And that's what they're saying now. They're saying, hey, 
we've gotten it back to that level. We've gotten, a, you know, a really good uh, population, a small mouth up there, took a lot of work, took a lot of money, but we're done, but we're going to keep watching it. We're going to keep watching it. And, and as fishermen, what I'm asking you guys to do is to keep, you know, keep your eye out. Watch people that are keeping fish that are too small. Watch, you know, watch, uh, you know, if there's been any fish kills or something strange going on there because the department can't be out on all the waters all the time. And if we start reporting stuff like that, uh, then we're going to prevent some of the some of the reoccurrences of some of these uh, problems that we're having with the fisheries. And we'll we'll all be better off. So they can only do so much. Now mm-hmm. they have to look and see what else can we do for other fisheries that we have. Yeah. Yeah. What was your other big takeaways from tonight's meeting? Uh, you know, I, I had had a few. You you brought up the, the smallmouth. The smallmouth thing was, yeah. was interesting to me because I wanted to know after we got this big smallmouth report, I'm running through my mind. We are the Black Bass Advisory Committee. Black Bass. Where does smallmouth fit into this? So I asked the question. I said, what did we learn from this? What can we take from what you learned about smallmouth? What can we do and apply it to? to largemouth. And really, it comes down to the same thing. We're looking for habitat, which is SAVs in most cases, and environment. In the case of the smallmouth, it's going to be tur- uh, turbidity. Uh, in the case of uh, our largemouth fish, it, it could be like something like uh, like we agree on is is uh, hull sinking. I think that's that's yeah. probably the biggest detriment where we're always trying to you know, the department and other people trying to find, oh, let's point to this industry or point to that or some other reason. But uh, it's the hall saying thing. So in addition to that, I think that the other interesting thing to come away from is that we've had a tidal bass manager whose sole job was to monitor and improve and, and manage the tidal bass fisheries, which is the upper Bay and the Potomac river primarily. And that had been Joe love for many years. And he kind of stepped away as he was promoted. He's he's his job title now, and I wrote this down. He is the statewide operations manager, which means he's in charge of everything. And they're hiring, um, and they didn't have many applicants for this, which was also surprising, but they're hiring a new title bass manager, someone not as not already in the department. So they're in, you know, we tried Thomas was going, well, is he from the East Coast at least? <laughs> Uh, so we're we're trying to to see who this person's going to be, and they haven't accepted the job yet. But that's going to be an interesting thing: is how much how much they will listen to us, uh, and how much impact they can actually have. Uh, I think under Joe Love's guidance, I think it'll be a good thing because Joe Joe learned uh, on the on the ropes, and he went through some turbulent times. Uh, uh, with Maryland DNR when there was a point when we were questioning whether or not the DNR would allow tournaments. Uh, there was a, a big question about that. And of course, that got ironed out and tournaments are welcome and the fishery seems to be doing pretty well. So tidal bass manager is going to take all of Maryland fishing and focus on just the tidal bass aspect. And that should be good for that should be good for everybody. And and the one thing I really want to bring up, and I'll probably be emailing the group is I I really don't like this. We meet once a quarter and we're going to have a four hour meeting because, again, it's like I get like, OK, November, December, probably not a lot happening. But from April to July, we're meeting once, maybe twice. There's so many things like the hall saying thing that happened. I believe it was late May and it didn't get brought up until the next meeting, which was a couple months down the road. Why couldn't we meet a few more times when if there's an issue, we're meeting to talk about it? Yeah, I, I mentioned, I uh, referenced a, uh, an October fish kill. And for us, that fish kill occurred in October after our September meeting. And we didn't have another meeting until January. And nobody really knew about it. And if you had known about it, you forgot about it uh, from Hall Um and, and you brought up the other. I mean, I don't like to beat a dead horse, but this is one that's worth beating because uh, I really believe that a lot of our problems can be solved by getting some cooperation with hall saners. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not getting it. I mean, it's that for people who don't know what it is, basically in a nutshell, a thousand foot uh, net, you stake it to the shore, you drag it out a thousand feet. It's a 10 foot deep net. You circle it back and you pull it towards the shore again and you trap all the fish in there that you can. And then you, what they're supposed to do is they haul, when they haul saying is they're supposed to pick out game fish and let them go and keep the catfish. They're mainly trying to get blue cat. 
But what they also tend to do is to leave their nets out overnight. And this is where major fish kills occur. We don't know the ones that were from last May exactly what caused them. But the one that occurred in October about five or six years ago was definitely pinpointed to a Halsane net that was left out overnight. And when you have all those fish jammed into a smaller area, uh, the largemouth are usually the first ones that are that are compromised, either from overcrowding or lack, lack of oxygen uh, in a confined area. So now we are to believe, and I think there were some chuckles, laughs, and disbelief tonight when we were told that, hey, you know what? Uh, the commercial fishermen see this problem. They feel our pain. And what they're going to do is they're before they go home and have a couple of beers or whatever it is they do at night, they're going to scoop out and gently remove all the largemouth bass from this penned in area and, and therefore will save those bass. I, I We've talked about it a little bit tonight. It seemed like it was kind of pushed off the table kind of quickly, but it's it's one that, uh, that Thomas it keeps bringing up. I will keep bringing I When I bring it up, I have to laugh because uh, they, they're not happy when I bring it up. It's just like, oh, come on. No, but it is a real problem. And uh, thanks to, I, I guess, guys like Rob Greich and a few others out there that shot video, uh, we had mm-hmm. some video evidence. Look at all these dead fish. And look, the only thing around was hull sanding. So that was another thing that came up that I think was a key point tonight. Brandon says, does Maryland not stock bass on the title Potomac? Um, are you mean like, Brandon, you mean like ever or recently? I don't think they have that in the cards right now for stocking the river itself. Well... Yes and no. So for at least 25 years, maybe longer, um, they have shocked up spawning fish out of the Potomac, taken them to small ponds, letting them hatch out, um, and then take those spawning pair and the uh, a lot of the fry, not all of them, but a lot of the fry, and return them to the Potomac. The problem that we see in stocking is that when you stock a two or three or even a four-inch bass, it becomes food. It becomes food for other species, whether it's yellow perch, crappie, catfish. So there's not a, a high survival rate. So the answer to your question, short, short, uh, long answer to your short question, they do stock, but how effective is it? And that's that's the problem that we're seeing. The the other thing is, I and and I am like the most pro tournament guy out there. I don't fish tournaments, but I really I I you know my job in the fishing business is to get you to fish so you'll spend more money on the sport, whether you buy a Skeeter or you buy a hook slide, mm. whatever it is, that's my job. So if you're a tournament fisherman and, and you go out and fish, I love that. But what we have to realize is that as tournament fishermen, you're bringing the biggest fish that that are in that area that you're fishing, you're bringing them to the way and you're keeping them in your live well, whatever happens to them, you go through the way in and in your mind, and in your eyes, you see that fish swim away and you say, that fish is okay. Well, they could be for a while. The bigger the fish, the more chances that we're going to have delayed mortality. And delayed mortality figures are up to about 20%. And it's that number's high because it's high in the summer and not as high in the spring as, or the fall. So you have a high, a high chance that that fish is going to die, even though you see it swim, swim away. So my message to, to tournament anglers is, gosh, take care of those fish. If you have smaller tournaments, try not to have them during the, the heat of the day. I know that fish on bass anglers and New Horizons, those kind of clubs, what they'll do is they'll curtail tournaments during those months, uh, July, August, or they will just have their tournaments four or five hours, starting at six o'clock in the morning, and they're usually weighing in by five, by 11 or 12 o'clock, they're done. So they're not out there during the heat of the day. So uh, that's something I think we can we can all take away from this as far as as that goes. So stocking, not so much, but there that's the effort that Scott Sewell has been pushing, where he's stocking fourteen inch fourteen inch bass. Those bass will survive and will and they will supplement year classes. And I think that's all we can expect uh, with when you start stocking fish of that size is that they're going to fill in gaps. Uh, in this little fish tree that I was talking about. So somewhere in there, that 14-inch fish will will help supplement so we'll continue to have bigger fish in these fisheries. And I think that's a that's something I really want to get down to eventually with how much, what, what what's the dollar bill sign on all this? 
you know, we're, we're throwing around, you know, stocking 10,000, a hundred thousand. We're not talking the dollar bill amounts to make this possible. No, that's why you'll hear Scott Stuhl, Sewell talk about, uh, and he's Maryland's conservation director. Been around, I think he's probably one of the most respected, uh, respected conservation directors in the country. Uh, and that's no lie. Every time I went to a Bassmaster Classic, it was like there were groups around him. And you go, hey, Steve, how's it going? Hey, Scott, you got a, a groupies now? Uh, but Scott will tell you that it ain't cheap. And that's why they don't stock tens of thousands of bass. He stocks fewer bass but he wants more substantial bass, ones that will survive. Again, if you go to, if you're stocking thousands of bass, you're stocking three inch bass or maybe even two inch bass. And those, those fish become bait. But the longer you keep those fish in a pond to grow them, the more expensive they become. And, you know, Scott has, has opted to raise money and, uh, and stock areas with more viable fish. Hmm. That's yeah. I mean, I we think should ask, we should ask him how much it costs because he he's really the one who spearheaded uh, that kind of stocking effort in Maryland. Uh, he's also the one he along with Roger and, and we've been working on this for a long time of getting that um, that voluntary uh, fund set up the black bass stamp, I guess is what they call it, where you can make a donation uh, to Maryland DNR's stocking program. Just, I mean, that's all that money goes to. I mean, a lot of times if you, you say, oh, my money, I buy a license. That pay, nah, I didn't pay for that. You know, it's not paying for much. They, they'll they take that and divvy it up however they want. But when they, when they have this stamp, and it's in effect now, that that money specifically goes to stocking. What we got to make sure, though, is that stocking isn't the same old, same old where we're sticking three-inch bass in, into our fisheries. We want to want to get some of these bigger bass so we can get instant results, not only from the catch rate, but also because they'll be spawning much sooner than a three inch bass. We'd also need to figure out like the, 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 again, just to beat this dead horse, compare and contrast. Are we talking a hundred thousand dollars for a three inch fish and then a quarter of a million dollars for 11 inch fish? Because again, if you have a, a stamp amount on that, just like what they're doing with, with their fundraiser now, you can incentivize people to help out because if I know it's a hundred thousand dollars to put an 11 incher in there, great. At least now I visually know how to get to the end. There's a goal, this, this vagueness and I get it. Like everything's expensive. And, and again, guys, what's crazy is Maryland is such a small state comparatively for the Potomac. It's not the size of Texas or Florida. It, it is a small state and they are doing the best they can. So I don't want this to be all a, from my end, I'm, I'm like shitting on Maryland. I get that, but it's what we can do to push this forward. Um, let's see. There's a couple you more should, things I want, I want to hit on today. And then have, guys, you should have, you should have Scott on to talk about that specifically. And you're yes. right. I think if, if, I think if people realize, so you're like, okay, where does your money go? Go stocking. Well, what does that mean? You know, I just told you it means three inch fish, but we, you know, we want to make sure that it's more viable fish, 12, 14 inch and bigger fish. And Scott could come on and talk about that because he went through that. He went through stocking the smaller fish and he went through bigger and bigger and bigger. And he's finally convinced that that's the way to go. Uh, one of the other things we picked up from the smallmouth uh, that I just, just remember is they mark their fish. They, they use a dye and they mark that fish. So when they, you know, and, and in fish uh, surveys, when they shock up fish, the most valuable fish statistically is what we call a recapture a fish that's been caught before because that that statistically tells them more about that fishery than catching just any other fish that they catch. It tells you uh, that they're surviving, tells you their growth rate, tells you whether they've moved a lot, but that recapture significantly uh, adds to the, the actual numbers of, of fish in, in a different way than, than one that hasn't been caught before. So we picked that up from the smallmouth people and they're, they're not really doing that with, with largemouth. And I think one of the younger members of our group learned about tags tonight, uh, about, uh, oh, that I was did. you. <laughs> that if you get a fish with a tag on it and it's an official tag and there'll be one in our area, it'll either be a, a Virginia, probably going to be Maryland, more likely going to be a fish and wildlife service tag. They will say fish and wildlife service, F FWS. It'll have LMB which is largemouth bass, it'll have a number for that fish. And then it'll also have a phone number for you call to call to report that fish. 
If you caught it and released it and left the tag on it, they want to know that. If you caught it, released it, how big was it? How much did it weigh? Where in general did you catch it? Uh, again, those, you know, when they do a tagging program, that's the kind of information that that helps. And when Maryland was really active with theirs, I learned a lot because I would call up and I'd say, yeah, I caught another one, you know, and here's the here's the tag number. Uh, what do you know about that fish? And they go, well, two years ago, we caught it uh, in, in the fall um, in uh, Swan Creek and uh, you just caught it in Blue Plains. So uh, in in the spring. So that tells us that the fish will move that far. Uh, when they'll move and that kind of thing. So they they know more about uh, about how to plant. I mean, fisheries management is not easy. The, the, it's a moving target all the time. And the biologists are, they, you know, they go by numbers. It is hardcore. And going back to what Thomas was saying, I think Brandon was questioning, wow, why are they quitting the stocking program? It's a numbers game. It mm-hmm. is numbers. We are going to return that fishery to the way it was in 2018. And when we do that, we're done. Next, next topic. Yeah, and, and I think we got to appreciate. We just we assume government, and maybe they do have endless money, but uh, Texas is a different size than Maryland, which is a different size than Rhode Island. And and money. And again, I have so many people talking about the Texas stocking program. Understand that Toyota, the vehicle thing, helped sponsor their fish hatcheries to get them off the ground. Like they had a ton of money thrown at them that some other states, they don't have that luxury. And again, so what Maryland is doing the best they can is pretty impressive. And Virginia and South Carolina, and South Carolina have taken notes from Maryland on how to raise smallmouth because the Alabama bass situation for my smallmouth guys that are listening, it's a problem. And the thing that I don't like that, that Joe Love said tonight was, well, even if we stock smallmouth, they're just going inbreed to inbreed with them. So what's the point? That's pessimistic yep. as shit. I don't want to hear that. That like once they're I in there, know. it's like, well, screw it, it's over. It's like, no, there's got to be something we can do to because if they get into like the Susquehanna or something like that, that's going to be an apocalypse for Pennsylvania. Yeah, hybridization is the dangerous thing with with Alabama bass. They they will mix, yeah. they will breed with the smallmouth, and eventually the smallmouth gene disappears, and what we're left with are Alabama bass. That's the thing that you can't fight. The thing that aggravates me is that. We did. We've done it to ourselves. Mm-hmm. Somewhere, somewhere, they didn't. They didn't fly in. You know, they didn't catch a bus. They weren't coming across the border. They they were brought in by fishermen and released. And it, and it's it's a big problem in Virginia, but in a smallmouth fishery, my God, in the Upper Potomac River, it would be devastating. And, and again, what do you do? And Joe, you know, said, "Well, we try to go out and shock and kill as many as we can." Um, it, it'd be a little bit easier to target them in the, uh, in the upper Potomac because there, you wouldn't be so concerned with largemouth and, and distinguishing between a largemouth, a spot and, and an Alabama bass. They're so close that it's kind of hard for biologists even to figure them out. So you'd just be killing them all. And, uh, that's what they'd have to do. But, uh, I'm with you. I hate, I hate to say see it when they say there's nothing we can do because you feel like there's always something they can do. Yeah. And and the thing I want to bring up about the catfish, and this is like my, my last point on, on future uh, meetings, y- you talk about removing blue cat. How many, what's a goal? Um, 10,000 tons, a hundred tons. Like when do you feel like you're winning? And it's just, it's just a vague answer. It's a mystery. As long as, as long as there's a commercial, uh, market for them, it'll continue, and they'll just keep trying to get as many as they can. And it's uh, kind of like Olay, you know, the uh, the, the, the Potomac River Fisheries Commission, uh, Maryland, uh, Virginia. They're saying, go at it, get all the ones you can. Pretty much, you know, uh, haul staining is a big way that they get these fish, and uh, that's um, probably why we're having such a difficult time in. And getting uh, anywhere with the haul sanders. If you go to a sport fish commission meeting and the commercial fishermen are put on the spot by somebody, they don't answer. They have a lawyer. They have a lawyer representing them. We don't have lawyers representing bass fishermen. So we got lawyers that are going out there with sport fish and pleading for their clients, the commercial fishermen, to be allowed to do whatever they want to do. And it's the, you know, when they came and spoke to us, when the commercial fishermen came and spoke to the Black Bass Advisory Committee, they came in and they said, like, you guys should love us. Uh, we're, we're getting rid of blue cats and they kill bass, you know. We're your friends. 
And I'm like, yeah, but you're wiping out spawning areas. You're, you, you know, you're ripping up SAVs and, uh, you know, that's not good. You're, so the commercial end of it is going to perpetuate this market as long as the blue cats are swimming around and the people are still buying them and they're selling them. My thing was, I asked, so on the back of your fishing license, it says, uh, you know, don't eat this fish, don't eat this fish, or only eat, you know, this much. Well, they have blue cat on there. And they tell you, in some places, don't eat any of them. Uh, in some places, they only have like a quarter of a pound a month, you know, yet these fish are sold at fish markets in Washington, D.C. They're sold in restaurants all around Virginia and up and down the East Coast. They're, they're sold. There's not a warning on your dinner plate when you get the menu. It goes, "Yeah, hey, honey, I think I'll have, wait a minute, I don't want the blue cat. Look at that. It says don't eat more than a quarter pound. Is that less than a quarter pound? Okay, I'll have one then. I mean, that, that doesn't happen. So I brought up, I said, I, I went to um, the Potomac River Fisheries Commission. I said, <clears throat> how does this happen? How do you, on, you tell the recreational fishermen not to eat them, but you don't tell anybody that's getting them from the fish market on Main Avenue or going yep. into a restaurant? You don't tell them anything. And they said, well, you know, the commercial fishermen, they only catch fish that are not contaminated, you mm -hmm. know, and they catch them. And uh, you're getting, you're getting a, and I'm like, how, what, you want, what? And they're, they're trying to convince us that, the commercial fishermen are catching the perfect blue cat. It's it does not have any heavy metals in PCBs, and they would never want to put that out there. But if you're fishing for them, you're going to catch the fish that has all the heavy metals and PCBs. So we want you to be careful. And that's the answer you get, Thomas. And you know what do you do? It's 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 all about the money. It's all about the money. And you didn't want to say that before this show. You said, I don't, I hope it's not about the money. It's about the money. It's it, all it, about the money. It is. And, and again, it's like when it came to like the smallmouth program, circling back to that, it's like they're trying to, I, I get that they're being successful. And, and then guys, I will, I think I need, I don't know if I need permission. I, I took some screenshots of the, of the PowerPoint presentation to show it, but no, over it's five. It's public. It's public. Okay, cool. Now that they said that, I will be putting that up there um, so I can actually share this now. But um, to kind of show what they did, they they were able to raise uh, 91,000 smallmouth over five years. I just want to give you guys an idea. If So you don't have to go back and watch the episode with John Odenkirk. For the last five years, they've been raising between eighty to 100,000 largemouth to put in just Lake Anna alone. Context is, in a year of stocking Lake Anna, they have put more smallmouth in than they have been able to raise smallmouth here. So there it's insanely hard, these numbers. And you're looking at the time where it's like you had 35,000, 38,000. Those are two good years, 2019 to 2022. And 2023 was kind of a meh at 15, 91,000. It's not bad, but it, it's a hard fish to raise. But the thing here is that's important. I think this is important for all that we're talking about, where it's smallmouth or largemouth. This is my big takeaway. When they say right here, demonstrates the ability to produce, to produce in the fish hatchery and fish Hatchery fish do contribute to the fishery. That is a big line because that's what you can take when you're arguing about largemouth bass and stocking them. It's been proven here that raising smallmouth and introducing them have a positive impact. I think that's the same argument that can be made for largemouth on the tidal Potomac. It's you have it can, to scale it. Yeah. And and the thing, make a distinction here because a lot of a lot of fishermen want them to stock F1s. Yeah. Uh, F1s do not produce F1s. Uh, they'll spawn, but they lose that F1 gene, if you will, um, and and you don't get you know F1s. But what it does is it, and as John Odenkirk has explained to me, it supplements year classes because those fish get big really quickly. And it goes back to this triangle again. We lose those big fish, the very mm -hmm. few fish up there. They put in a fish halfway up that gets to that level very very quickly. And we end up with not only a, a big fish up at the top, but we get fish that exceed that. Uh, you know, all the fish that have been caught on the, the James and, and that area down there where they stock. Uh, you know, they were I was right in the middle of that battle. And I was like very hesitant to support stocking because you, you needed to have environment. You need to have habitat. And just stocking alone wasn't going to do it. And it just seemed to me to be a thing like, oh, we want to put more fish so we can catch them. But as it turned out, I was wrong. I was totally wrong. And the stocking program in Virginia 
has been extremely successful. People are catching the the fish of their lifetime. In fact, mm -hmm. I think Odenkirk just there's no limit, uh, a creel limit uh, or size limit on on Lake Annis. What did that do? Now now tournaments can have a 10 inch limit if they want, a 12 inch limit, 14 inch limit, whatever they want to have, so they can get out there and have more people fishing. And getting back to what I said, my job is making sure you guys go out there and spend more money on this sport. And uh, when you when you stock and and John, I mean Lake Anna is a great example. I mean it this it's really taken off because there was a period where we called it the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea. You couldn't, you couldn't catch any fish. You couldn't catch anything out there. And now yeah. you know you go out there and catch your biggest fish ever. It it that's a huge success story. And, and something else, it literally this really because this is what happens, guys. These meetings every quarter are like seven hours long. Um, so it's so much information to write down notes and digest. I've twice brought up the idea that if you want to have a fundraiser, why can't we have a fundraiser tournament? And it's kind of a meh kind of thing there. It's like I, I'm proud that they created some kind of way that we can donate to the fish program. Is it the state can't just run a tournament? They can't say like, hey, listen, we're going to run a, a bass tournament at, at a Matta woman once a year and, and all the profits are going to go to our stocking program. Why isn't that a thing? Uh, I think they they want to distance themselves from, I mean, because really bass tournaments are a lottery in many respects, except they do have a level of skill. And I think that's a legal threshold that if uh. you're a government worker that you don't want to get close to. However, what I would do, and it, I know that Ed Dustin and his tournament, they have a battle of the border, and I think they donate some of their proceeds either to their to the Maryland ramp or the Virginia ramp, depends on who wins. I think you reach out to those people and say, hey, you know what, you're, you're, you're making donations, uh, let's put it into our stocking program, and I guarantee you those guys would jump off, because that benefits Maryland and Virginia anglers, and they would get it in a heartbeat, and then they could have a special fundraising tournament to, to do that. Uh, not all the proceeds would go because yeah. I, I've done that with charity tournaments. We we did a St. You've done a St. Jude tournament. I don't know how many years, 25, 26 years, where we, at first we said, okay, we're only going to pay out in prizes. Well, that was fine. But then we start getting, you know, people going, oh, what am I going to do with another frog togs rain suit? You know, or how many quarts of oil I think I can use? So we had to go through and pay out to, pay out to the winners in cash, but then the profit that comes with running a tournament, we took that and donated Just that. Just out of curiosity, to how much money did your hospital. tournament and raise? To this day, close to $300,000 since we started doing it. Um, so that could be a viable way to do that. I And, you know, I, I heard you bring that up tonight and I thought it was a really good idea, but I, as I started to go through it, I go like, well, wait a minute, that, that they won't do that. There are a lot of things they won't do because it comes close to a third rail that government workers don't like to get involved in and uh but if you make that appeal to the guys who are already doing it and you got a guy yeah. who's already doing it ed dustin's already doing it uh you're talking several thousand dollars a year that would be easily raised to put back directly into stocking and um, what we have to do now is make sure that money that's going to that stocking program goes to productive stocking no more three inch graphs Let's, you know, even if it means we only put 10 bass in there, let's make them worthwhile because those fish will spawn. The other fish we put in are just going to be food. They're going to be bait for other fish. They're just not going to, they're not going to do anything. They're not going to move the needle. And I think we just, that comes down to pricing. I think that's, that's where we have to be honest because I get it. Like I talked to Halliker who ran the, uh, the front Royal Smallmouth program. Um, and you guys can go watch that podcast. So it was good, but it's like, yeah, guess what? When the fish get bigger, they're going to start eating each other and it's a whole shit show and stuff. And so I think th there's a tax from their, in their mindset, there's a tax when you try to raise them past a certain size. And I think if, if Maryland or someone came down, it's like, listen, we could raise them to this size, but it's going to cost this uh, much more. If you just give us a price figure, I think people will swallow that. If they know, if I pay this, I get this. And that's where the tournament thing is so interesting. Like I, I'm glad that you said something. I didn't realize that with the whole gambling angle, like, okay, maybe they don't want to do it because I know like there was a massive veterans day tournament, like Anna, and I'm pretty sure Larry Martin, if you're in the chat, you guys raised a ton of money every year with that tournament. I know fishing tournaments do raise money. I, it just seems like the perfect thing for maybe Ed of the battle of the borders. Let's make a tournament to raise money. Cause Joe loves it. Like, Oh, you, maybe it'll raise a couple of hundred, a couple hundred dollars. I think you could raise thousands of dollars from a, yeah. a perfectly executed fishing tournament. Like it, it's a match made in heaven. 
Yeah. And, and I, like I said, I think guys like Ed Dustin would, uh, it wouldn't take much for him to, to reach out to his, his participants. And, you know, even though they're already going to fish now, it's like, okay, now instead of that money, just going to repairing a boat ramp. Cause they, boy, I tell you, Virginia, I, I, again, I, I wrote a piece about this, about they were promised all kinds of stuff about improving the tournament site over at, uh, at Leesylvania. And, and then all of a sudden uh, it went away and it was like, well, wait a minute. Why are we paying bass tournament boats that were launching? We're paying more of a ramp fee than the guy out there with his jet ski. Okay, mm-hmm. so why why was that? And they said, oh, because uh, you know it, it's it requires more. We have to get there earlier. Well, wait a minute. You know uh, we're not getting there that much earlier. And and besides that, the one day that we have our tournament, it, it, it represents two or three days that the guys were out there practicing using that boat ramp anyway. So we're bringing more money to you. Why are you, are you taxing, so to speak, our, our guys? And uh, so that money now that still goes to these, to these boat relaunch areas, I think they could do better if they, would, if they would invest in the fishery with either directly stocking, getting permission from Maryland to stock their own fish or participate in the, in the stocking program Maryland has. And one of the questions we need to ask you know, and I, I remembered hearing this somewhere. So you're raising these fish. They spawn in the spring. You get them, you get the fry, you feed them and feed them and feed them. I don't know that they carry over to the next spring. I think you have to like stock those fish then. I think I don't so. Know that I don't know that they would handle the the shallow, cold, cold water. Uh, and if they would, in effect, be able to uh, keep those fish alive through through the wintertime. So they probably, uh, you know, are limited with their capabilities based on the type of hatcheries they have. Yeah. But, um, you know, buying fish, hey, <laughs> that, that seems to me to be co- more cost effective all the way around. And again, the, you get Scott Sewell out here and your your people will have a ton of questions. He will answer them all because he, he's he been doing this for a long time. He, he's older than I am, my gosh. You know, so he, he knows what he's talking about with this and he's done it and he's still doing it. He's still raising money to to stock uh, big fish. Um, this is a good question to probably, uh, cause I guys, I don't want to be here all night tonight. Um, and I'll link everything in the episode description that we talked about too. Um, Mark Burke, uh, how much competition for funding does the freshwater scene have with the saltwater industry? Wow. Um, Mark, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Competition for funding from outside oh, sources. Yeah. Like cold water that- versus warm water. Is that what you mean? Like the trout people. I'm going to assume that like, but there's no stocking for the salt water. I believe I know the trout is. Yeah, they, they definitely, I mean, stocking trout does a couple of things. One, um, it takes pressure off your native trout. Okay. Uh, two, it's, it's a, a government supplemented, um, program. So they get, they get some funds from the federal government for stocking trout because it's, it's part of the wallop bro, uh, legislation where they want to encourage people to, to fish and they excise tax and all the stuff they buy. So, so trout for some reason has been the chosen species for people to go out there and try to catch. And they are fun to catch. And, uh, you know, you put and take and, uh, you put them in the rivers, you put them in the lakes, people go out there and they fish for them and they go crazy and they, they caught their trout. So there's a lot of money in that. Saltwater seems like they spend more money trying to keep us from fishing. <laughs> you know, I don't, uh, you know, they keep restricting, uh, you know, what you can catch. They limit the seasons and and uh, that kind of thing. But uh, I think that's what you're looking for, Mark. Uh, if not, uh, if that's the same, Mark Burks. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark's a great guy. He uh, he designs designs fishing rods, and he designed one for me. And I've got to I've got to get get out there and try to use it right now, but. Uh, um, yeah, so with the money, it's all about money and, uh, you know, there's just so much of the licenses, you know, when you buy a fishing license, that money goes to a government. I don't care what they say. It doesn't go to the DNR. It goes to a government and who knows what they spend it on. I mean, they got a nice building up there in Annapolis and they got nice offices and, and all the great parking lot and all this sort of stuff. And, um, how does that translate to us? Well, this little fund is one that can translate to us. I don't mind paying, you know, for a fishing license and having it go to the managers and all the people who run things. But if you want to see your money work for you, 
It's these kind of little programs like this. I mean, and this took, I'm guessing this took 10, 15 years to get done. Uh, they had to keep going back and going back. And Maryland's governor, I think his name is Moore, um, he he said, yeah, uh, this makes sense. You know, let's let's get more fish out there and have the fishermen pay for it. All right. But I'm really concerned about fish this big or fish that are 14 or 15 inches. And I think that's that's what we have to look at. You know, the other thing we talked about tonight, you don't remember what we talked about. And, and I think uh, Thomas is being modest. We. We've been working with messaging um, to anglers, and it started with tournament anglers that we wanted them to know how to take care of fish. So uh, Gene Gilliland, who's the conservation director for Bassmaster, he's the, he, uh, I think he was the Oklahoma, head of Oklahoma's DNR for many years, and he's like the guru of, uh, of, of fish conservation for tournaments. Uh, he did some, Roger Tragasar and myself also did some, and these were messages directly to tournament anglers and to tournament directors. It was required viewing when you got a tournament permit. So you had to watch these videos. So we did those. Well, now the department's changed it a little bit. And they've employed uh, Mike Iaconelli. Uh, in fact, uh, he uh, was just in the elected to the uh, um, Bass Fishing Hall of Fame, inducted in October. And uh, so he's very well known. Everybody knows him, love him or hate him. He's, he's the guy out there. Mm -hmm. uh, they put together some video with some kind of stock footage and, and threw it together. And Thomas looked at it and went like, poof. And we he ended up with some pretty slick uh, video uh, based on what, what he had to work with. And the messaging out there is still fish care, but it's also come to Maryland, man. We got all mm -hmm. kinds of Mike Iaconelli likes to fish here. You should come out to fish as well. Um, and, and there'll be more videos, uh, live, yes. well, um, live well care and stuff like that. Uh, those videos are, are coming out too. I think they're good for everybody. Um, I did a video for them, and I can't remember if it's still up or not, but how to remove a hook from a gut hooked fish. And, you know, there's this part of everybody says, oh, well, you just leave the hook behind. Eventually it'll rust out. And I'm like, really? I mean, when I catch a fish and I see it's paper thin, first thing I do is look in its gullet and there's usually a hook in there because they, they can't eat past that hook. They still want to eat. But they just can't eat past that hook. So I, I get them out and I get them out without any fuss or muss. And, um, you know, we could probably do a, a whole video on that thing as well. But it was taught to me by uh, one of my favorite outdoors writers. He's a, a bass fisherman himself. Uh, Mark Hicks writes for Bassmaster and, and a bunch of other ones. And he said, hey, I bet you have a lot of clients. This is when Senkos first started being used. And you gut hook a lot of fish with Senkos. He said, I bet you have a lot of fish out there that, that get gut hooked. And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, Here's how you get them out. And the first time I tried it, I said, this is amazing. I started jumping on other people's boats. I said, you've got to hook a fish. They go, yeah, I, hold on. Put it back in the water. Let me come over there. And I come over and jump on their boat and take the hook out for them. It's very easy to do. But it's those kind of videos, the messages, uh, better fish care. Uh, if you, you know, and I see people all, and I catch, you know, Thomas I, told me, he says, I, that I'm the kind of guy, I don't mind if people get mad at me and I'll say whatever's on the line. And, I see guys that, that that post pictures of their fish laying on the carpet of their boats. Yeah. And I say, hey, nice fish, but yeah. if you're practicing catch and release, you've just reduced your chances of that fish releasing well. You shouldn't lay it on the carpet. Then I, I take all the slings and arrows. I'll probably get a couple of anglers to support me, but everyone say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. That fish swam away. It was fine. Um, but the slime coat, you know, you lay it on a carpet and, you know, trout fishermen have known this for years. You have wet hands when you handle a fish and that kind of thing. So, you know, we're trying to get the message out if you really want to practice catch and release, especially with these bigger fish. We we really have I, I, I fished with some when I first started guiding, I went to the Japanese embassy and I because I, I, I didn't know where to start my business. So I went to the Japanese embassy and I knew they liked to fish. So I brought him out to fish with me. I have never seen, other than women, I've never seen a man appreciate a fish as much as these anglers. They would oh, catch yeah. fish and they would treat it like it was it was gold, and they they would revere it and slowly handle it, you know, and get their picture and then 
put that fish in the water, revive it. And, and just the, the sheer joy of, of seeing that fish swim away. You know, a lot of times we, we see pros just throw their fish and, you know, just throw them in the water or throw them into the bag when they're doing their weigh in, uh, which is one of the things Major League Fishing with their, uh, you know, catch, photo and release type of, of tournaments. Uh, you know, they say you can't drop a fish in from above the gunnel. You, know, you definitely can't boat flip them. Which I thought was pretty funny about your wife doing that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was laughing all the way through. I, I uh, hope you're getting the mic on. But, um, you know, all these things that we can do that they were just, I mean, boat flipping, come on, man. That's just like, how much, how much macho do you want to get? It's a fish. It's a, it, a three yeah. pound fish and you want to slam it in the deck of the boat. So all these things, especially with braid now, you know, you catch a fish and you're ripping mm -hmm. the fish's face out. Um, we've gone to the, uh, no piercing, non-piercing culling clips. Uh, we do a lot of things because the fish that we're catching, the ones we're most proud of are the ones we seem to do the most abuse to. I a hundred percent agree. And I really wish bass didn't like, I, I get the no nets their thing, but come on, the, the net's so important there. And then guys, okay, we got three questions we're going to get answered. And then, and then I got to like, like be able to like do this because we're going to go till freaking midnight. Um, we got uh, big GTV. Um, and there's, these are two questions that are the same. So we'll answer these two questions back to back. Anything I should carry on my kayak to help with bleeding fish. And then David Williams is, is there a special tool to get to get the hook out when it's that deep? Okay. So let, let's start. Our first thing is when you're bringing a fish to the boat and you're, especially if you're using braid and you notice that it's gut hook. Okay. Now that fish is not going to get off. You know, so you don't have to rip it out of the water. You don't have to keep, you could kind of just let it rest there on the surface. I usually leave the fish in the water and I look into their mouth and I see that hook and I see where that hook is. If the hook is, uh, you, you look into the mouth, you see the hook and you take the eye of the hook and you bend it towards, or you push it towards the tail of the fish, put your finger under the bend of that hook while it's in their mouth, push on the eye of the hook and pull on that bend at the same time. And that hook will pop right out. It won't cause any bleeding or anything like that. The other hand, though, if you nick a gill, and I've heard people pouring Mountain Dew and stuff like that. I, I don't know, but I would try it. I mean, you know, at that point, there's just not a lot you can do. And and I see other, I see guys holding up fish and their blood coming down the side of the fish. And I'm like, that fish is dead, you know. But before yeah. when you gut hook a fish, get that hook out. Uh, I'm sure there are probably tons of videos out there. But again, you just you reach in. Take that hook eye, push it towards the, come out of their gill and put it towards their tail. Put your finger around the bend of the hook, push and pull at the same time. It'll pop right out for bleeding. Get them back in the water as soon as you can. And usually bleeding, see, the time I have bleeding is usually on a crankbait. Those those seem to, they suck that thing in and they they get a treble back there. Um, don't, don't be afraid to, to cut a hook to save the fish if that's the way you feel. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. And then I guess the, the last two guys to kind of close out the night, uh, uh, lovely new CNO Canal Visitor Center at Williamsport. Craig, I know I visit that all the time. There's also an issue right there at the canal because people take cast nets for the bluegill for the flathead and there's like no more bluegill in the canal, but that is going to be another episode because I want to get into that because that's that's a whole other issue. Um, and then the last question was from JL Scott Fishing and Eats. Uh, funny, our series has caught almost 20 citation smallmouth since October. In the last three months, there are solid smallmouth populations of all densities in Maryland and Virginia systems. 100% agree. I think the program is a success. I think the biggest question is whether they should have ended it. Because if you're if it's working, don't stop, I guess, is the thought process versus when, when it was articulated to me, it's like, well, if it tanks again, we'll bring it back. It's like, well, no, I don't want you like once the house is on fire, the, fu the fire department will come back. How about we do preventative stuff? But God, that's just a whole other topic. I get another three hours on. Um, and we've been talking. I've been in one meeting for about five hours. It feels like so uh, guys. Well, when I was your age, I used to get tired, too. <laughs> you see, he's an immortal God. He can keep going all night long. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this. And then guys, what we'll do is in April, I think is when the next meeting is, we'll do the same thing. And I'll try to bring on more members of, of the board if they want to come on just to kind of talk their feelings about how things are. I'm going to list the PowerPoint presentation uh, to the small mouth uh, 
on my homepage. I'm also gonna link all of Steve's stuff. This is gonna be unlisted tonight so I can polish up the audio. It's going right back up tomorrow morning. Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and YouTube. So please like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.